Good morning and welcome back to Black Bear Forge. What do you say we take a closer look at the flatter we forged in the last video and see if we can get this ready to finish. So here is our flatter made out of the mystery steel. Right now it has about a two and five eighth inch square pad. It's about 65 millimeters square. The overall tool is four and a half inches right now which is about 110 millimeters. So overall I'm pretty happy with this. It's a little bit out of balance right through here. This side's a little longer than this side. That's something I'll fix at the grinder. I'll just I'll grind it all smooth and flat first and then I'll grind it until it is equally square all the way around. If we end up with about two and a quarter inches I'll be pretty darn happy. I don't mean this to be a big flatter. This is my big commercially made flatter. This is an antique and it's at two and a half inches square. So if this smaller lighter one has a smaller square head, I'll be perfectly happy with that. The other problem that this has is getting a little uh, overconfident punching the eye. I ended up with an eye that is not straight through. So that means I'm going to have to file this down and make the eye a little larger oval to make it straight or I'm going to have to do some really weird shaping of the handle to make it work. Either one of those is an option. It may end up somewhere in between. I think either with a big round file or a die grinder I can clean that up pretty well. So at this point it is mostly a matter of grinding, getting it to shape, taking care of that eye, making it a good looking tool so that we can go ahead and harden and temper it. So let's head out to the grinder. We'll go ahead and grind this. Like always, I'm not going to make you watch me grind for half an hour. We'll just look at a little bit of the grinding. You'll get an idea of what I'm doing to it. If you don't have a big grinder, you can do a lot of this with an angle grinder, or you can just clean it up, square it up with a file. The fact that it's a little bit asymmetrical really isn't going to hurt it in use. I'm just going to make it a little bit cleaner, better looking tool. But if you don't have a way to move that material quickly, I'd just leave it. It's not going to hurt it if it's an eighth inch bigger on one side than it is the other side. I took this down to a 220 grit finish so it's ready to harden and temper as far as the outside of the tool but in this eye again it's kind of crooked and I want to go ahead and try and straighten that out and make a much better eye so that the handle is straight. It'll be easier to handle or rehandle in the future if I ever need to. Although I find I rarely have to rehandle my top tools. On my older tools some of these handles have been in for 15 or 20 years. I'm going to go ahead and do that with a die grinder with a carbide burr. These are real easy to break, so go slow, be careful. Any jerky moves and you can easily snap one of these carbide bits, but they do a fast job and they're really effective. They also aren't cheap, so you really don't want to break one and have to buy another one. Okay, that should be ready to harden and temper now. We've got a nice eye on it. Been cleaned up and I made sure there wasn't a sharp edge around the outside of the eye. The whole thing is clean. This is good and flat. It's probably not perfectly square with the top of the tool, the flatter part, which is too bad, but it's not really going to hurt it. You got to make sure you put it where you want it no matter what. And the handle just almost starts in there, so it'll be easy to fit the handle. I think we're in pretty good shape overall here. I ended up taking this down to, 
it's right at 60 millimeters just a hair over two and a quarter inches so this is just a so it's exactly what I'm after and about four and a quarter inches long I couldn't couldn't be happier with the size the only thing I don't like about it is that slight twist here and I could do a whole lot more grinding but I think the handle would still be slightly crooked so the only way to fix that really would be to make the square pad smaller and if I decide I don't like it I can do that after it's hardened tempered and on a handle it's easy enough to dress these up like that so that brings us to the hardening and tempering stage so the first thing I want to do is take our piece that I forged out a little bit longer and skinnier of the same material and we want to do some test hardening. The other day when we forged the flatter, I let this piece air cool and it was very difficult to file, but it would file. So it wasn't just glass hard, but it wasn't bad. And air cooling this tool might be all it needs with just a very light tempering to make sure it's not stressed from hardening. But it might also be better off if we oil quench it. So we're going to try that. After I air cooled this, I put it back in the fire, then I buried it in the vermiculite, let it really cool slowly. And at that point, it filed very easily. So it definitely anneals well in vermiculite. Sort of kind of hardens in air, but not completely. So let's heat it back up. Let's oil quench it and see what happens. I've taken the time to preheat my oil. It needs to be too hot to put your hand in, but not hot enough to fry french fries in. Or perhaps fry chips in if you're on the other side of the Atlantic. So now I'm going to heat this up, and I'm going to heat it a little hotter than what I think might be a reasonable critical temperature. Again, we don't know. It might harden at 1475. It might need to harden at 1550. It might need to harden at 1800 degrees. That's one of the unknowns about this particular steel. But I'm going to heat it up into something around the 1500 to 1550 range. And we're going to quench it in the oil, and we're going to see how hard it gets. That should be pretty good. It might actually be hotter than that, but it tells us if it'll harden in oil. It doesn't tell us what the critical temperature is necessarily, just whether or not it'll harden. And people always ask what my oil is. It is a commercial heat treating oil. It is made for quenching parts being heat treated. I don't remember the brand or the exact formula of that brand. You'll just have to shop around. So that should be as hard as that's going to get in oil. Let's go ahead and test it with a file. Now that can be filed, but it's even more difficult than when I air hardened it yesterday. So I think oil hardening is the way to go. Another test I did with this material yesterday was to put it in the vise and hit it with a hammer and see if I could actually snap off a piece of it. And I could not do that air hardened. It bent, but it bent with much difficulty. Make sure you wear your safety glasses for this kind of a thing if you're going to try it. And I'm using the same six pound sledge I used yesterday and I, that I couldn't break it after about six blows. It bent but didn't break. Today all it's doing is rattling it down in the vise. But it's not even bending, but it also isn't breaking. That's tough stuff. Now what that tells me is that, while this may not get hard enough to be a good knife or anything like that, it's way more than hard enough to be a really good flatter, a swedge, a fuller, most bottom tools. It might even make good hot chisels and things like that that you need to sharpen on a regular basis anyways. Woodworking tools, probably not. Now it might get harder in water, and we'll go ahead and try that, although I'm very happy with its performance hardened in oil, and I can't imagine why I'd want to harden this in water, but we'll do it just to see what else happens. I got that up to about the same heat. Give it a good harden in the water. Now ideally, you should not 
harden in your slack tub, you should use fresh, clean water every time. But for a test hardening, I'm fine. Also, you ideally should warm up your water instead of having this great big block of ice floating in here. But this will be a nice, severe test to find out how hard does this really get. It's a little harder to file, but it is still not as hard as a piece of W1 or O1 or something like that at full hardness would be. So it just doesn't have that kind of carbon content. But it's still harder than it was in oil. And it's more brittle now. But even though that is brittle, that is a fairly fine grain structure. It'd be better to look at it under a microscope and that would tell you a lot more. So I'm not so sure that water hardening this would be such a bad idea once it's tempered, but you should then repeat all these same tests at different tempering temperatures. If you can still break it like this after tempering it to a relatively high temperature, I certainly wouldn't water harden it. But since it was so tough oil hardened, for what I want these tools to do, I'm gonna oil harden it. So that gives us some pretty good ideas. Really, I'm very impressed that this wasn't more brittle hardening it in water. So I think that's probably an option. That may have also been at a little lower temperature. So I think this probably is more in the 1500 range is the right temperature. Again, the only way to know is to do it in a temperature controlled oven, make 20 or 30 scrap pieces of identical sizes, harden them all at different temperatures in different mediums, oil, water, air, hardness test them, and I don't own a hardness tester, so that's something I can't do, and then break test them to see what the grain structure looks like, which ideally you should look at under a microscope. And I don't have a microscope. So this really is something that we're just making best guesses at in a blacksmith shop. We don't have the ability to do the thorough scientific examination of this material that would be ideal. And then you'd want to do all those same things once you decide this is how it should harden. Then you want to do it all over again at different tempering temperatures to try and figure out what the best tempering temperature is for your particular use of the steel. So again, we're just guessing, we're just doing the best we can in the blacksmith shop. This is as far as I'm going to take it. If I have small tool failures, I can adjust it. If I had a never-ending supply of this, I would probably do more tests and try to dial it in as perfectly as I possibly can. But I don't expect to have a never-ending supply of this stuff. Once this is gone, it's probably gone. And like I say, hardening it in oil gave me exactly the results I wanted. I will then temper it at a little bit lower temperature than I might normally, just so I don't soften it too much. And we'll try it out. I'll work with the tool and see what happens. Now this piece that I've been testing, anything that was hard enough to quench and anything that was sticking out of the vise during the break test, I'm gonna get rid of. That's all been stressed too many times. It's gonna be unpredictable. But the rest of this, that's about a three quarter inch square bar, it's still just fine. I think I'm going to draw it out, maybe make a chisel or a center punch, something like that, and use it and see how it behaves for that kind of a tool. And maybe we'll do a video on a center punch or something out of this as a next video. So I'll set it aside and we'll get back to work on it at some point. So now we need to bring this up to heat. This I want to make sure soaks and comes up to heat slowly. So I think I'm going to go plug in the heat treat oven. I'm going to bring this up to 1500 and I'm going to quench it in oil. We're going to see how it behaves at that. Then I have a well-defined starting point for any additional tools I make. And if this seems too soft, I can knock the handle out of it and do it all over again. Well, the heat treat oven has brought our flatter up to 1500 degrees and it's had a nice soak at that temperature. So we're ready to oil quench it. There's a real likelihood that 1500 is not really hot enough to get this as hard as I might like it. So we'll do a quick file test after we harden it, and then we'll see if it's hard enough. If it is not, I will anneal it, 
and then go through the whole process over again at a higher temperature. It's better to start at a lower temperature and work your way up to a higher temperature than it is to start high and end up with it way too hard. You have larger grain growth, more likely to fracture, and you don't know if you were 25 degrees too hot or 200 degrees too hot. And that's a big difference when it comes to hardening and tempering. So at 1500, I'm hoping we got it right on the money. If not, we'll have to do this all over again and it may be some experimentation. This is one of the real downsides to using salvaged steels. But let's give it a try and see what happens. I'm going to go ahead and cool the entire tool. If we need differential hardness in the struck end, I will temper it further with a torch. And that's a little easier. It keeps the oil from burning as well. A tool this heavy generally causes the oil to flame, and that's really not the best idea. Okay, let's go test this with a file and see how hard it got. So because my oil is good and hot, this is still too hot to touch, so I'm going to make sure I wear gloves with it and the oil will still smoke. That isn't just glass hard, which is really kind of what we want, but it is certainly harder than it would be in its normalized or annealed state. Plus it has probably decarburized some and the hard steel is going to be a little bit further down. So I think we're okay. I think I'm happy with that hardness. And we can always reharden it later if the tool doesn't hold up very well. I'm going to go ahead and put this in my little toaster oven, set at 350, which will at least remove the hardening stress. It may not really temper it. And we'll test it with a file again after this tempering cycle. If I need to, I'll turn it up to 400 and do it again. This is all trial and error, and there's no guarantee anything we're doing is going to work perfectly, but we should be able to end up with a tool that is pretty good, even if it isn't exactly right on the manufacturer's spec for whatever this steel really is. So I'm going to leave this in there for an hour. I'm going to go have lunch, and I'll meet you guys right back here afterwards. Well, our flatter has now been in the tempering oven for an hour at 350. And it's time to give it another file test, see if it feels a little bit softer than it did. At the very least, that takes the hardening stress out and makes it less likely to just crack as a result of being quenched. So I'm going to test this in two places. Well, the, the working edge is still very hard. I think I would like to temper that back a little bit more. And the struck edge is still harder than I would like it as well. So I think I'm going to put this back in at 400 and see what happens then. So instead of recording two minutes of video and then waiting for an hour, hour and a half, and then doing another two minutes of video back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, I'm going to go ahead and call this video good for today. I'm going to do whatever I need to do to get the results I want and we'll either do it as a part three for this which will only be a three or four minute video just to to cover what I ended up doing to get this to temper properly or I'll just talk about it in a future video so if you want to know what happens with this you're going to have to watch a few of the future videos we got our eye and the all set up and straightened out so it should go on a handle very nicely looks like a great tool because things are just a little bit crooked on here, I might go ahead and grind this outer profile down. And whatever I end up doing, we'll talk about it. We'll have a recap of the project. Now, this is one of the reasons that I am an advocate for known steel of a known property. Once you figure out what you need to do with S7, you can buy all the S7 you want. Once you, same thing with 4140, 5160. Whatever material it is you decide you like to work with, and that suits your needs in your shop, buy that material over and over again. You don't have to go through all this process figuring it out. For me, that saves days worth of work, thousands of dollars in shop time. By using known materials, it's worth spending a little bit extra. 
But I know a lot of you folks out there really like salvaging steels. It's part of the fun of blacksmithing to take stuff that is otherwise scrap, turn it into something useful. And I understand that. I enjoy doing that too. It just isn't really cost effective most of the time. So even though we can go through this process, we can figure it out, and I am certainly going to use all of the steel that Steve sent me, it isn't what I typically advocate for. It's not what I typically do in my shop because it isn't the most cost effective. It isn't the most efficient. So with that said, I hope you enjoyed the video. Give it a thumbs up if you did. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button. Feel free to stick around, watch a few of the other videos, share the videos with your friends, but then by all means, make time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, but stay safe, wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next one. If you would like to provide financial support for the videos here at Black Bear Forge, there are links in the video description to both PayPal and Patreon. These are merely donations. The content is free and will remain free.